please. Good morning. Thank you to the Foundation Baltasar Garzón for having opened this social space, social space for public opinion, and a space that triggers dialogue, dialogue on an important question that has an impact on our society. However, a question that has also been put aside, not only in our country, but also in other societies. We are talking about the universal jurisdiction and it being enforced. We are talking about whether uh, uh, human rights are actually universal human rights, according to what it was said in the first chapters. They said that human rights, uh, everyone had uh, rights, well, human rights. So at that time, foreigners, workers, and women did not enjoy human rights. So now we are talking about the type of international community that we want. Is it a community based on peace, value, human rights, and the defense of human rights? Or rather, we are talking about an international community where the one and only subjects are big states, those states that work or want to operate or work outside or outside the law, that is to say, not being subjected to any kind of control. What about human rights? Are they supranational? Are there effective standards? So we are talking about essential standards, essential elements that help us build our society and civilization. That's why I say thank you so much for creating this space, for opening up this state, and so that it gives food for thought for people to reflect about what is happening at this point in time. So I wanted to share two ideas with you. Uh, however, the chairperson has asked me about the state of the question, uh, the National High Court. Well, what is happening is that we are just having a legal conflict, a legal, legal conflict that we are just putting on the table. So here we have a number of standards, a number of norms that enter into conflict, and then legal experts decide or rule on the one that prevails. And of course, well, legal experts always give priority to the higher rank norms and standards. So therefore, international law. So what we are seeing nowadays, this is something that is normal that is expected in a state of law. Because, well, the, law, the judges also take into account the rule of law. And then the lawmakers are also subject to the legislation. And of course, to, moreover, to the defense of human rights and to the deep content of uh, human rights. And one of them is the constitutional guarantee. So we have learned that basic human rights that are not well constitutionalized, for instance, the economic, social, and cultural rights, if they are poorly constitutionalized, that is to say they do not have a legal effective guarantee, they just dilute themselves, they just disappear. They disappear and they become powerless. So the two ideas that I wanted to share with you today is, first of all, trying to think about the question, why Spain shifted from being a role model within the context of international human rights, a country where we had the visits of people from many countries, where many people from many people from different countries came to us to find justice. And now, why have we shifted to a situation where universal jurisdiction, after the amendment of 2009, became limited, very much limited, through a number of uh, connections that had to be there? So. That is to say, where we have only national victims, 
Guatemala, Tibet, Guantanamo, one of the two causes or cases of Guantanamo. The other cases, when the 2009 amendment came into force, the other ones were closed. The other cases were closed. So therefore, non-application of international law. So it has been said repeatedly over these days, well, independent of the place where the crime was committed and where the crime was committed. Well, the last amendment, that of 2014, somehow establishes a number of criteria, well, that even wasn't the, the amendment of 2009. And now it is very little, it is difficult to identify it as universal jurisdiction to prosecute international crimes. And why has that happened? Well, it happened because the public opinion and the opinion of the judges have not given, have not received the credit of universal jurisdiction. Here, are several courses have been given uh, pressure from other countries, and then also because, well, some values from the past are being recovered. For instance, the criterion of non-interference. It seems that some uh, countries may interfere in internal conflicts through weapons. However, they do not tolerate interference of other countries uh, due to crimes against humanity. So therefore, we have to reflect about the creation of the ICC, which has been a milestone in human rights. So, and sometimes it has disencouraged or disincentivized some uh, countries to prosecute crimes, but actually this is not the way it is, because this court, this ICC court, is complementary to national courts. And actually, well, the ICC, in some cases, well, in some cases, that's just that's not, that's, that's, that's not take action. So, and now I would like to refer to you to the Spanish case. So I'd like to refer more specifically to the Article 23-4. So it is confusing because it helps us confuse some institutions that we should not confuse. So we are comparing here war crimes to drug dealing. War, war, uh, war crimes are state crimes or crimes committed by structures protected by the state. These are also systematic crimes that have an impact on collective goods, that is to say that impact above the actual victims, that is to say attacks against uh, civil uh, population, civilians, journalists, etc. And, however, drug dealing is a private crime. It is not a global issue. It is not a, an issue of the international community. There are many societies in the South that do not have that problem. So that is one of the elements that we should be able to, we should go deeper to, into. Universal justice is a tool that is at the service of prosecuting the most severe crimes, international crimes. International crimes are those that promote or that have to be enforced 
through international law. And this, despite what the domestic legislations say, and these crimes are criminalized in the statute of ICC under Article Number 5, war uh, crimes against humanity, etc., because they have an impact on the goods of, of international goods, that is to say, peace and justice, and also the well-being of humanity that embraces all the values that are associated to the respect of human rights. So, and actually, this is what we are talking about. Here we have an institutional design with, led by the ICC. But here, we really should bear in mind that the big powers, that the big and powerful countries have not ratified the ICC. Even some of them have uh, entered into bilateral agreements with weak states to ensure that the public officials are not brought to the ICC. And then the statute in its preamble regarding the international crimes says that states are obliged to investigate them and to prosecute them. So therefore, this is something that the states, for instance, our state has committed itself to doing through its ratification. Well, the states assume commitments through treaties, through conventions, but then they forget. Later on, they forget to enforce them. So if we know how to fine tune that, if we understand that there are other international crimes that are also significant, let us take into account that torture or Enforce disappearances. Well, here we are talking about mass crimes. These are not the crimes that we see, you know, in films like the serial killer. So they are part of the imaginary of the US. Now, here we are talking, these are the real mass crimes. Here we have serial, actual serial killers behind. So they must be distinguished. They must be told apart from individual crimes. If the defenders of in universal justice can explain clearly what we are talking about. And if they make also differentiation between of impunity, because Article 23.4 treats the obligation that the states have to prosecute international crimes with extraterritoriality, and then they start to talk about regional, extraterritoriality, organized crimes. So this comes from northern cultures. And then somehow that is also a reflection of uh, fiction. Sometimes they were talking about the impunity of big drug dealers. So at the end of the day, the big fish are never prosecuted. At the end of the day, the, those that are prosecuted or caught are just poorly paid sailors. And they are just doing the sailing, and they are just transporting uh, uh, some goods or, uh, uh, that it is illegal. So and actually, I think it is very important to make a clear differentiation here and not to confuse one with the other. And also, it is also very important that our society, our lawmakers and decision makers ask themselves the following. Do we think that prohibition of genocide, 20th century, it is a very negative uh, example in terms of genocide, starting off with the Armenian uh, genocide, Holocaust, Cambodia genocide, killings in Rwanda? Do we really want us and do they really want the prohibition of the genocide of the great crimes against humanity. 
They are just big crimes because they are against humanity, as well as war crimes. Do they want them to be enforced or not? This is the question. Do we want them to be enforced or not? If we want them to be enforced, states have to comply with their obligation of investigating and prosecuting them. This is a question that it is there. And here we are talking about legitimation of the big crimes against humanity. And well, the society and all the other stakeholders should be well aware of well aware of what it is at this. Ramon said, the amnesty law or pardon law. Sorry, I cannot. I'm sending hand right in. I've read it before. Who's, who's written this question? Legal assistance to victims, victims of crimes and assist, assistance, existence, legal assistance, legal existence as a reality. You mean? Whether it is assistance or existence of victims, well, it, it is the case outside the laws which declare the termination of criminal liability of perpetrators of these serious crimes against humanity. States can only be identified by, by the state, but still it is now the time of the victims and it's the victims requesting from the state, from the media and perpetrators that, that things have happened. And I think one of the changes of the public space here in Spain has been the upheaval of victims, the rising of victims that has forced us to acknowledge that there were very serious crimes during dictatorship, crimes against international law and there is suffering. And, and he said how he had gotten from, from, from the victims these ideas of suffering and that the suffering is still alive and hence there are some claims. And as he explains in, in a book that I recommend to you, the unavoidable duty, I think it is, or inexcusable duty, which is another overview of territorial jurisdiction, that it's the duty that falls on the state, on the territory, on the crime and the nationality of perpetrators to investigate and prosecute, criminally prosecute. Um,